The newest episode for The Dangers in My Heart, titled I Died, is everything I wanted from this anime. It got Ichikawa just right. The pacing was on point, the animation was gorgeous, the characterization was perfect, the humor was fantastically executed, and the rom-com fluff had me grinning from ear to ear. However, with all of that said, I've actually scrapped two reviews for this one episode. It's taken some time for me to figure out exactly how I wanted to approach this incredible episode and expound on why it's more than just wholesome fluff. Sometimes, you've got to fail a couple of times to figure out how to succeed. And what I've realized is that one of the greatest strengths to this entire series as a whole is how it grounds its fantasy in something relatable to its audience. What, that doesn't quite make sense to you? Well, let me explain. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And here's the thing, fantasy can be whatever it wants to be. It can be whatever you want it to be. An exotic and unbelievable story of space dragons fighting katana-wielding kitty cats. Or perhaps it's about a young witch learning how to use her powers to make awesome video games. Seriously, fantasy can be anything. However, no matter how amazing your fantasy is, if it is not relatable or grounded in something relatable like a strongly written character or a great cast of well-written characters or engaging themes, you will quickly alienate your audience. In the case of The Dangers in My Heart, the fantasy is that this tall, gorgeous, young model would ever fall in love with someone like Ichikawa, and that this angsty, murder-obsessed Shota would ever have a chance with a popular girl like Yamada. Sure, there are those people who will gravitate towards a story simply described like that, but what keeps the audience here for the story is how this funny, growing relationship is anchored in an equally engaging, humorous, and relatable school life setting. To showcase this, let's go through each part of this episode. First off, when Ichikawa is lurking in the library, brooding over his chance to kill Yamada, his thoughts are derailed by her antics to make a silly kid snack. All she needs is water, and in her excitement, Yamada keeps spilling all the water and makes a horrible mess of everything. Ichikawa surprises both her and himself by stepping in and cleaning up her mess, and then running to the home economics classroom to get a cup so she doesn't have to keep shuttling water in a small plastic triangle. And in the end, the obvious solution was just to simply take the snack to the faucet and mix it there. <laughs> this is a highly exaggerated situation, yes, and anyone would realize all you need to do is just take the snack to the sink, but these characters right here, they are kids and teens, and anyone who has spent a lot of time with kids and teens knows that they have a knack for overcomplicating small tasks. And that's exactly what both of them are doing right here. As a teacher, I saw this kind of stuff happening all the time. And oh boy, the constant messes. But the fantastical nature here is that Ichikawa reveals that he's a good person at heart and is eager to help, though he doesn't realize that about himself just yet. And it's a fantasy that Yamada recognizes this and that his own antics become endearing to her. But anchor all of that in this funny scenario where two teens are being dumb and it becomes amazing and endearing. It's pure rom-com cotton candy. And you don't care because you're just gobbling it up. It's so good. We then get the next big setup with Yamada hanging out with her girlfriends. The classroom is sweltering hot and they all start fanning each other. Though poor Kobayashi is getting the short end of the stick as Yamada keeps hitting her with the fan by accident. And some of the boys there have decided that, you know what, we're going to try to sneak on over there and see if the girls are sweaty enough to turn their uniforms see-through. Ichikawa then uses his creepiness to create an opportunity to block them and let the girls escape. And as a quick tangent right here, I love that this series, both manga and anime, is honest about its portrayal of girls. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's okay for them to have girlfriends. It's okay for girls to be friends and just friends. Too often, especially in Western media, the girls fall into several different categories. Either they are openly hating each other, or they are secretly hating each other, or they are 
overly validating each other. Oh, you're just so perfect. You're just, there's nothing wrong with you. Or they're crushing on each other. But in this episode, we get to see Yamada and her friends helping each other, teasing each other, insulting one another, playing games together, doing class projects like any normal teenager would, and working together to protect their girlfriends from a guy who is coming on a little too hard. That hit way harder than it should have because it shocked me how starved I am to see relatable and realistic depictions of girlfriends. It shouldn't be this hard, people. But getting back to it, this realistic setup is complemented by the fantasy of Yamada asking Ichikawa to cover for her and escape Kobayashi, which leads to a growing understanding between them. The next chapter is when the class is getting ready for the cultural festival. They're transforming their room into a haunted house, and Ichikawa has been asked to help Hara paint the spooky banner that they'll be hanging up. And no, this isn't a fantasy. As Hara is painting and the jiggle physics are in full effect, which Ichikawa is unable to look away from, I laughed so hard. My response was in part because I remember clearly one of the most ridiculous experiences in high school when during a dissection in biology, a girl endowed like Hara was wearing a shirt that plunged past her girls, and she was sawing away at that sheep brain. And I guarantee you this, because I was there for it, all the guys at the table were taking bets for when those girls would pop out to play. And no, the fantasy isn't the misunderstanding between Ichikawa and the rest of the class as he tries to cover for Hara. Misunderstandings happen, and simps and people looking to climb the social ladder in high school are more than happy to jump at any instance to white knight for the popular kids. And Ichikawa's ridiculous ramblings are also very realistic, especially for an angsty kid like himself. No, the fantasy here is that Yamada realizes that Ichikawa is selflessly taking the blame to avoid creating an antagonistic misunderstanding between her and Hara, and she then comes to him to apologize for what went down. Finally, during the cultural festival, Ichikawa is acting very relatable and decides he's going to go and hide from the festivities rather than endure the awkwardness of not fitting in with the crowd. Some might say social anxiety, but really more often people just feel like they don't belong or that others don't belong in their lives as they like to have them. And so they actively avoid people in social gatherings. It's not out of anxiety, but out of a self-absorbed misconception about where they actually are in reality. And then we've got Senpai coming up and trying to hit once again on Yamada. That's also very relatable. I mean, guys just don't give up. Her girlfriends realize what is up and they form a barrier to protect their friend and escort her somewhere else. And that is also very relatable if you've spent enough time around girlfriends who are trying to help one of their friends out whenever the creepy dude comes to hit on them. And Ichikawa reading the atmosphere correctly for a change, even when he doesn't understand himself, is incredibly relatable. How many of us are able to see someone else's situation really clearly, but at the same time we're unable to figure out our own mess? It happens all the time. So, what's really happening here, the fantasy is, is that he is able to intercept Yamada and become the hero by going with her into another exhibit. And there they get to share a moment together, finding out that they live close to each other, and that really shouldn't be a big romantic moment, but it ends up being one. And it is such because this is a culmination of all the events between them from episode one up until now. And what this highlights is that Ichikawa's unexpected awareness of and kindness towards Yamada have not gone unnoticed. She's beginning to like this little angsty boy. Sharing a moment alone with him is exactly what she wants. And it's sealed with her taking a picture of both of them, purposefully misinterpreting Ichikawa's request. Why? Well, because taking a picture together with him implies that they are more than just classmates. It's her subtle hint inviting him to get to know her better. It's a hint that she likes him. And that is sandwiched them by the very relatable response from Michikawa that he totally misses the pass. <laughs> Which again, that's just what guys do. In the past year, I've been analyzing why shows like Vermai and Gold and Please Don't Tease Me, Miss Nakatoro are amazing and wholesome romantic stories. Those stories, though, are kind of heavy hitters, setting up toxic relationships and then putting in the legwork to redeem them and make those couples healthy and strong. The Dangers in My Heart takes a much-needed refreshing 
approach, taking its time to show how opposites can attract. Rather than trying to redeem a relationship, or spending tons of time to justify it, or worse yet, just simply throwing two characters together, having all semblance of actual fulfilling romance go out the window, the dangers in my heart takes the time to sculpt a beautiful relationship between two unlikely characters. And that is why this story is so needed right now, and why you should absolutely do yourself the favor and watch it. You won't regret it. If it feels like we aren't going very far with the characters very fast, trust me, this story takes full advantage of the slow burn to craft an incredible romance between two misunderstood teens. Again, it's totally worth it. If you're looking for other fun reviews and storytelling insights, then please check out our other videos here or jump on over to our podcast, Camille's Harem. And if you'd like to support us, please like, comment, share, subscribe, or even better, check out the books we've published. Links for them and more are in the description below. Thank you for joining us on this sweet journey we call writing, and until the next video, y'all, choose.